love, hate, and propaganda. The War on Terror. A two-part series with George Strombolopoulos. The global fight for your mind. After 9-11, George Bush declares war. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda. But how can you declare war on a noun, a tactic for causing great fear, while you attach a name to it? This group and its leader, a person named Osama bin Laden, are linked to many other organizations in different countries. So now you and your friends can go to war in a place called Afghanistan. But what happens when you can't find your man? Well, you find another bad guy. The security of the world requires disarming Saddam Hussein now. And again, you use a lot of propaganda to make the new bad guy look even worse. Winning a war with bullets and bombs is one thing, but how do you win the hearts and minds of a digital generation? That's what you have to ask yourself when you're connected to a war filled with love, hate, and propaganda. Tonight, shock and awe. March 2003, for the second time in less than two years, America invades another country. It started at 9 p.m. local time. Operation Iraqi Freedom begins, and the media can't get enough. Terrifying blasts, metastasizing into huge mushroom clouds. War sells, and all the networks want a piece of it. Once again, it's big budget stuff. Cool graphics, patriotic music stings, and live bombings. The shock and awe. Air shock and awe is great for ratings. You can bet Osama bin Laden is tuned in. Seeing American troops on Muslim soil is great for Al-Qaeda propaganda. The Iraq invasion was the best PR for Al-Qaeda, actually. Telling um, newcomers or young people, see, this is the West. They are full of double standards. They, uh, you know, invaded the country just because uh, one president decided the other one is evil and it's the war on terror. Watching it all from his home in Wichita, Kansas, is Ethan McCord. You know, I watched the, the shock and awe and uh, thought, you know, it was a spectacular sight. You know, it's, man, look at, look at what we do. We're, you know, we're so bad. There's, can't nobody do anything to us. McCord enlisted in the Navy after 9-11. Eventually, he would be deployed to Iraq. But in 2003, he bought right into the propaganda. Like a lot of Americans, um, I was raised uh, with this pride of, of America that we, you know, we wear the white hat, we're, we're good people. You know, from playing G.I. Joe and Rambo to Chuck Norris and Delta Force where Muslims were bad and they're, they're out to uh, attack us because of our freedoms. Um, so yeah, I had the, you know, all Muslims should die attitude. Not surprisingly, most Iraqis are against the war, but there are some, especially the Kurds living in northern Iraq, who actually welcome the invasion. Iraqi Kurds wildly celebrated in the streets of Kirkuk in northern Iraq today. Ayub Nuri grew up on a farm in Kurdistan. He was there when Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against his own people. And when I was nine years old, the Iraqi army attacked my town with chemical bombs and killed 5,000 people in one day alone. So it wasn't easy at all. It was very tragic and full of fear. Like many Iraqis, Nuri had great expectations for the American invasion. I was very hopeful about uh, the war because I thought the war would mark the beginning of great change for, the, for Iraq itself and for the Iraqi people. A liberated Iraq can show the power of freedom we thought America would come, change the regime, everything would be prosperous and great. That gave us a lot of uh, hope. The regime is starting to lose control of their country. As per usual, the official American propaganda line is confident to the point of cocky. This is going to be a quick surgical strike, a decapitation strategy. Remove Saddam Hussein and the regime, and the resistance will collapse. 
For Western journalists, reporting the news is a major challenge, just like it was in the first Gulf War back in 91. A lot of the media are once again kept well back from the action. Most journalists are corralled at the military command center in Doha, Qatar. The mission of Operation Iraqi Freedom will be achieved. It's more than a thousand kilometers from Baghdad, and the only news here comes from military PR staff reading carefully written press releases. That this regime is coming to an end. In this carnival of liberty, the first form of celebration was economic. But some journalists did get into Iraq. Resources, that's looting to you and me. It was clear months before the invasion that Baghdad would be the center of the world. Every journalist in North America and in uh, Europe wanted to be there at some point or another to see how it would unfold, and I was one of them. The first news of the mightiest military operation of all history came at 38... Throughout history, the media and the military have had a roller coaster relationship. This is Matthew Halton of the CBC, speaking from Paris. In World War II, many reporters were actually given a rank and a uniform. You can take a taxi now out of the war in Saigon. In Vietnam, reporters were free to work on their own. That ended up being a disaster for the military. Considerably increased air activity here in Saudi Arabia. Not wanting a repeat of the first Gulf War shutout, this time around, reporters complained. The military responded by bringing back the embedded journalist. In fact, of course, what happens is because they are so closely embedded with their military advisors, etc., who are responsible for their security, that there's a real ethical problem about distancing yourselves from the people who are protecting your lives. Early in the war, that embedded strategy works for the Americans. For the most part, Western media are doing their patriotic duty. The liberation, or invasion, depending on your perspective, is moving along nicely, all very sanitized, not a drop of messy blood in sight. While there is some Iraqi resistance to the invading armies, it's less than expected. That may be due in part to the effectiveness of a very simple, low-tech form of propaganda. There's a delicious irony in, in Gulf War II from a pro propaganda perspective in that it's often associated as a, as a high-tech war, and yet one of the most successful means of propaganda is a very basic form of dropping leaflets that we can trace back to World War I. And the Americans targeted both the home front and the fighting front in these leaflet propaganda campaigns, and they proved to be highly effective. The basic message is, we're not here to harm you. We're after Saddam Hussein. Three, two, one. Cue. Cue. For a totally different perspective on the war, there's Al Jazeera, the Arabic language news network. The 24-hour news channel is similar to American networks like CNN and Fox News. And like the American networks, Al Jazeera has its own agenda. It caters to its mostly Arab audience of 40 plus million. Good job. The Americans weren't happy about the way in which Al Jazeera presented the war because Al Jazeera, unlike the Americans, were prepared to show the violent aspects of war. And these reports were picked up in the West, in London, for example, by The Guardian, and eventually they would find their way back into the American media, and they would actually contest the official American view of this war. Al Jazeera did not report the US military announcements as if they were fact. They would uh, add the disclaimer, the caution, that this is coming from the US military. It can't be independently confirmed if that was the case. This, um, this balance really upset the Americans because, of course, they wanted uh, Al Jazeera to report uh, whatever they said without questioning. Ayub Nuri has become a journalist working with foreign media. He doesn't like Al Jazeera's take on the war. I, I don't think Al Jazeera television was balanced because uh, they branded Iraqi people who celebrated the fall of Saddam Hussein as criminals and gangsters and looters. And uh, I did not agree with that. It was insulting to me and everyone else who was happy about the fall of Saddam Hussein. 
all of us to try to tell the truth, to say what we know, to say what we don't know, and recognize... Al Jazeera said, yes, there are deaths, there are injuries, and we will show them. American networks didn't do that, uh, and Washington was furious with Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera has a pattern of playing propaganda over and over and over again. What they do is, is when there's a bomb goes down, they, they grab some children and some women and pretend that the bomb hit the women and the children. What the Americans really need right now is a propaganda win. A battlefield hero would do nicely, preferably someone young and photogenic. And before you can say lights, camera, action, they find one. 19-year-old Jessica Dawn Lynch, private first class. The teenager from West Virginia, who didn't think she'd ever see combat, is about to become America's sweetheart. While traveling in a convoy near Nazaria, Lynch's company is ambushed and attacked. 11 of her fellow soldiers are killed. Six, including Lynch, are captured and listed as missing in action. The Americans are hell-bent on saving Private Lynch. They learn that she's being held at Saddam Hussein General Hospital in Nazaria and send in a special task force extraction team. I was laying alone in the hospital bed in Iraq and I could hear helicopters and gunshots and bombs going off in the background. And then the next thing I knew, there were soldiers inside the building screaming, where's Private Lynch? Hey, are you in any pain? The whole choreographed scenario is captured on the Army's own combat camera. So here with you, Jessica. The next day, the Pentagon releases a five-minute video that claims Lynch has stab and bullet wounds and was slapped about and interrogated on her hospital bed. See the camera right there? Smile. Can you smile for, for the family? See your folks? You couldn't have scripted it better. Well, this looked like the perfect Cinderella story. This was a young woman who was injured, uh, a miraculous escape against all the odds. Uh, it seemed the perfect story. Specialist Joseph Hudson, 585-65028. Meanwhile, Al Jazeera TV is broadcasting its own brand of propaganda. Where are do you come from? Texas. It shows interviews with American prisoners and images of American corpses. You can imagine how that played in America. A few days later, Al Jazeera comes under fire, literally. Its Baghdad bureau is hit by U.S. missiles. The Americans claim it was accidental. Al Jazeera correspondent Tariq Ayoub is killed in the attack. At this point, the U.S. Army has taken over Baghdad. Resistance has been minimal, and the supposedly elite Republican Guard are nowhere to be seen. Right outside the Palestine Hotel, the home base for international journalists, one small incident becomes one giant piece of propaganda, the perfect photo op. A group of men struggle to topple a statue of Saddam Hussein. The United States Marines are happy to help. The toppling of Saddam Hussein's statue represented a major sort of symbolic act uh, in that it represented, from the American perspective, the, the end of the war. Just as, for example, the chipping away of the Berlin Wall was a symbolic representation of the end of the Cold War. The toppling of the Saddam Hussein statue took over two hours. Most American networks covered it live. Throughout the day, CNN replayed the toppling every 7.5 minutes. Fox News? every 4.4 minutes. Could it be that this was game over? Three weeks later, that question is answered. Not only is the war over, but guess who won? George W. Bush, the President of the United States of America, the Commander-in-Chief of all U.S. forces, the man who declared war on terror in the first place, joins his troops to make the triumphant announcement. The United States and our allies have prevailed. Once again, all the American networks carry it live. The fact that the aircraft carrier is just a few miles off San Diego is hardly worth mentioning, so nobody does. 
December 2003, still no sign of WMDs. But on the plus side, Saddam Hussein is finally captured. The image of a weak, disheveled man stripped of all dignity is good propaganda, for America at least. A lot of people in the Middle East believe in conspiracy theories. So many people would have not believed that Saddam was really captured unless they actually saw uh, him captured and saw the images. Results from the raid include confiscation of two AK-47s, 750,000 US dollars in $100 denominations, and a white and orange taxi. Having accused Saddam Hussein of manufacturing weapons of mass destruction, it was very important, therefore, from the American perspective, that they actually captured him, especially as Osama bin Laden was still at large. The euphoria of Saddam's capture is short-lived. March 2004, four private security contractors driving through Fallujah are attacked by locals. They are beaten, set on fire, and dragged through the streets of the city. Two of the corpses are hanged from a bridge. It's all captured by news cameramen on the scene. Most broadcasters show the footage with varying degrees of self-censorship. The horror show at Fallujah destroys a well-managed propaganda campaign. Up to this point, the American public has, for the most part, been shielded from images of death. Fallujah changes all that. The squeaky clean image of war the US government tried to maintain is shattered. Support for the war is in decline, and Americans are clamoring to bring the troops home. Even though the attack on the Americans was caused by a small mob, optics is everything. George Bush needs to be seen to take control over the city of Fallujah. Fallujah must cease to be a sanctuary for the enemy, and those responsible for terrorism will be held to account. He sends in the Marines. Over the next six months, there are two separate bloody battles. Both sides suffer heavy losses. Al Jazeera crews and a handful of independent journalists are right in there covering it. Because Fallujah was such a bloodbath and was such a disaster, uh, and so many Iraqis were killed, including so many Iraqi civilians, that uh, the U.S. was very keen at this point to control the flow of information. Not surprising, then, that Al Jazeera's operations are shut down completely by the Iraqi interim government, with a little help from the United States military. For Ayyub Nouri, the young Kurd who originally welcomed the Americans, the Fallujah onslaught changes everything. I was very disappointed by that because in one year alone, the entire city population of Fallujah paid the price for killing those four people. It was a turning point for me and for many other Iraqi people. Once again, the U.S. administration needs a distraction. And they find one in Pat Tillman. Remember the Cardinals linebacker? He became the poster boy for military recruitment. After a brief stint in Iraq, Tillman, along with his brother Kevin, is sent to Afghanistan, where the hunt for Osama bin Laden continues. Sadly, Pat Tillman is killed there. He's awarded the Silver Star, Purple Heart, and promoted posthumously to the rank of corporal. Pat's best service to his country was to remind us all what courage really looks like and that the purpose of all good courage is love. His memorial service is televised nationally. The spectacle bumps Fallujah into the background, at least for now. For Iraqi insurgents, however, Fallujah is a godsend. They use it as recruitment propaganda. The events spark a jihadi wildfire, becoming the rallying cry for insurgency throughout Iraq. 
Hastily produced DVDs of the fighting and CDs with songs praising Fallujah citizens are openly available in local markets. And they're selling. Suddenly, it's as if the war has switched directors midway through the movie, going from what started out as a Jerry Bruckheimer victorious, spectacular epic to a dark, just how low can we go, Quentin Tarantino nightmare. And now, two words are about to be forever seared in the American psyche. Abu Ghraib. Even before the invasion, Abu Ghraib had a grim reputation as a place of torture and degradation. When the Americans move in, the depravity continues. The story of how American soldiers abused Iraqi inmates at Abu Ghraib prison has rocketed around the world since... The CBS program 60 Minutes goes public with the story. When the photographs or the scandal in Abu Ghraib prison came out, I was not only disappointed, I was very angry. That's exactly what Saddam Hussein did. That's why I was confused, disappointed, and angry. And I was just one person. I'm, millions of people were angry by, angered by this. Not only in Iraq, across the Muslim world. For Ethan McCord, who is still serving with the US Navy, the Abu Ghraib scandal is no big deal. When the photos came out, uh, I, I felt that the soldiers were doing their job, you know? Um, that these, these, uh, these Muslims, uh, Muslim men, they, they deserved everything that was happening to them. You know, at least we weren't cutting their heads off like they did to us on TV. Um, yeah, so what, they, they got a little embarrassed. For Al-Qaeda, the Abu Ghraib photos confirmed what their propaganda had been saying for years. Americans really are evil. These were gifts uh, for, for Al-Qaeda propagandists because the, the damage was so great and those pictures so horrific that they, they, they exploited them quite well and used it to their advantage. The U.S. is stumbling badly in the propaganda battle. It's clear there are limits as to what your supporters will accept. Throughout America, there's a growing impatience with the war, especially among politicians. For Jessica Lynch and Pat Tillman, the government violated its most basic responsibility. The U.S. Congress hears from America's sweetheart, Jessica Lynch. At my parents' home in Work County, West Virginia, it was understaged by media, all repeating the story of the little girl Rambo from the hills of West Virginia who went down fighting. It was not true. The heroine who starred in Combat Camera's Great Escape goes public with her version of events. Yes, she was taken prisoner, but every other part of the story was embellished. She wasn't shot. She never fired back at the enemy. Her injuries were sustained when her vehicle overturned, and she was well treated in the Iraqi hospital. You're doing wonderful, okay? I had the good fortune and opportunity to come home and to tell the truth. Many soldiers, like Pat Tillman, they did not have that opportunity. Another truth comes to light. Pat Tillman was not killed by the Taliban insurgents. He was killed by friendly fire. Army brass knew that at the time, but chose to cover it up. Tillman's brother, Kevin, sums up what many are feeling. Pat's death at the hands of his comrades is a terrible tragedy. But the fact that the Army, in what appears to be others, attempted to hijack his virtue and his legacy is simply horrific. George Bush's war on terror has been festering for three bloody years. In Iraq alone, it's clear that all sides, the so-called coalition forces led by the U.S. and Britain, and the various insurgent factions have all committed unspeakable atrocities. The death toll among Iraqi civilians is over 24,000. The American taxpayer is on the hook for billions of dollars. And Osama bin Laden is still at large. Summer of 2005. There's a hurry up and wait feel to America's wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. The mighty US military machine is stretched to the limit. There's no victory in sight and no sign of Osama bin Laden. Wherever he is, he's getting his message out. Al Qaeda's influence is spreading, and so are the battlegrounds. 
Their new weapon of choice for distributing propaganda? Cyberspace. The internet provided Al-Qaeda with a vast ethereal recruitment tool with which they could disseminate their message to the Muslim world. And unlike the traditional means of communications, you can put these messages up instantaneously, they're transmitted globally, and governments can't censor them. They just can't control them. Over the years, Al-Qaeda have learned how to create, distribute, and maximize their propaganda. I think uh, Al-Qaeda is very sophisticated when it, when it comes to propaganda. And I think actually since 9-11, uh, they've really controlled the message. The images of Osama bin Laden, for example, were very carefully managed. We always see him using his uh, Kalashnikov or mounting a horse, which plays on the image of the modern guerrilla fighter. They've been better, in fact, in, in recruiting people by spreading their message than we have in, in deflating what they're saying. So when we talk about this sort of winning over the, the hearts and minds uh, in terms of propaganda, I would say that they, they've done a better job than we have. Al-Qaeda is quick to recognize the power of the Internet. Online message boards and chat rooms are used to raise funds, recruit and train new members, coordinate attacks, and encourage others to do the same. Madrid. Almost 200 are killed when four commuter trains are bombed. The attack was Al-Qaeda inspired. So were the July 7 bombings in London. The attacks on three subway trains and a double-decker bus killed 56. Three of the four suicide bombers were born in the UK. Nobody saw it coming. These were not Muslims in the hills of Afghanistan. These were young men, largely born and brought up in Britain, who had become radicalized by the propaganda messages that they were picking up on the internet from Iman, like Anwar al-Alaki. Al-Alaki has a blog, a Facebook page, and a ton of YouTube videos. The American-born web-savvy imam knows how to maximize the internet for spreading propaganda. The fact that the U.S. has administered the death and homicide of over one million civilians in Iraq. And young people are buying it. They're switching from passive observers to active participants, all from the comfort of home. These lone wolves are growing Al-Qaeda, one recruit at a time. Al-Qaeda speak the language of the young people, and they know exactly where they can catch them. And this is, this is the problem why, especially in Western countries, we see um, many, many young people, by the way, men and women, getting radicalized. Rashin Ara Chaudhry was born in Britain. She's 21, and by all accounts, a model citizen. The Chaudhry family are Bangladeshi and are not particularly religious. In fact, Rashinara doesn't go to mosque on a regular basis. She prefers to pray at home, alone. Home is also where she likes to surf the net. What connected me to Islam, even though I was a Christian, was the person of Jesus Christ. I used to watch videos that people used to put up about like how they became Muslim because I thought their life stories were interesting. I certainly wasn't looking for Anwar al-Alaki. I just came across him. The Jews and the Christians will not be pleased until you become like them. Rashinara watches hundreds of hours of Anwar al-Awlaki's lectures. She now sees herself as a Muslim first, British second. And she's on a mission that is hers alone. She goes to her local community center to meet her member of parliament, Stephen Timms. I found out that he very strongly agreed with the invasion of Iraq. That made me feel angry because that whole Iraq war is just based on lies and he just voted strongly for everything as though he had no mercy. Rashinara is so angry about the war in Iraq, she stabs Stephen Timms twice in the stomach. 
MP Stephen Timms survives the attack. Roshanara Chowdhury is arrested. Police investigators find no link to any Islamist group, no evidence that Roshanara attended any meetings, and no extremist literature in her home. She was acting completely alone. Chowdhury is given a minimum 15-year sentence for attempted murder. The beautiful thing, but also the dangerous thing about the internet is that you can create something from wherever you are. Police say they have foiled a major terrorist attack against targets in southern Ontario. The internet also played a key part in a terrorist plot closer to home. The Toronto 18 planned on attacking the CBC and beheading Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Many of the, the members of the Toronto 18 were recruited uh, through chat groups online. One would meet another member, that would bring in another member. They met in small community groups and slowly the plot just grew and got bigger and bigger and bigger. The power of the internet as a propaganda tool increases sharply in October 2006. The launch of WikiLeaks, a website dedicated to publishing secret classified data, means that anyone could get their message out and do it anonymously. Anyone who wants to expose dirty little secrets now has their own platform. And there's no shortage of secrets in wartime. As an intelligence analyst posted in Baghdad, Bradley Manning, private first class, had access to top secret information. Allegedly, the 24-year-old leaked hundreds of thousands of classified documents, including the now infamous Apache helicopter footage known as collateral murder. Come on, fire. The video clearly shows a group of men being gunned down. Moments later, two men with a van try to help the injured. A few blocks away is Ethan McCord, the young man who enlisted in the Navy after 9-11, spent most of the war stationed in Bahrain. But he wasn't happy. I had to do something, you know, I wanted the bravado of being uh, the, the soldier out there that, you know, um, was kicking in the doors and, and, and uh, shooting Muslims in the face because that's what I've been told I needed to do. McCord wanted so badly to be a part of the action that he transferred from the Navy to Bravo Company 216 Infantry. You know, there was a saying at the time of uh, to win the hearts and minds of the people of Iraq. Well, our battalion had a saying, two in the heart, one in the mind, which was you're going to go over there, you're going to shoot them twice in the heart and once in the head. Make sure they're dead, double tap. McCord's bravado was about to be put to the test. Moments after the Apache helicopter had obliterated the civilian van, McCord arrived on the scene. So I looked inside, and when I looked inside, what I saw was um, a little girl about four years old. Um, she had blood all over her. Um, you could tell that she had shrapnel wounds to the stomach. Um, she uh, had glass in her eyes. Resting on the bench seat was a boy about seven years old, and I immediately thought he was dead. Uh, he had um, a severe wound to the right side of his head. Got a wounded girl, we didn't take the rest of my McCord picked up the little girl and ran to get a medic. He then returned to the van. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, why I went back to the van. Um, I think I was upset and I wanted to take pictures so I could show people that this is the reason why we don't do this. And I was, you know, inside I'm screaming, you know, I'm just like, what the fuck are we doing? These are babies. And uh, that's when the boy inside the van took a labored breath. He's just like moved. And uh, I started screaming that the boy's alive, the boy's alive, and I grabbed him. And I held him up against my chest, and I was telling him, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be okay, I have you, don't die, don't die, don't die. And uh, he, you could see me running towards the Bradley with him in my arms, and um, there's a point where I stopped running, and that's because the boy looked up at me, and uh, then his eyes rolled back into his head, and he went limp, and I thought that he had died at that point. And so I stopped running and I placed him inside the Bradley. Can you tell the uh, battalion that two civilian children 
doing casualties are coming back the rest of my and the Bradley over. Roger, that's a negative on, on uh, evac and the uh, two civilian uh, uh, kids to uh, Rusty. They're going to have uh, the uh, IVs will take them up to a local hospital over. My platoon leader, who's a lieutenant, was there and he said, McCord, what the F are you doing? Stop worrying about these MFing kids and go pull security. Um, at that point, I had already gotten the kids out, so roger that, sir. And I went up to a rooftop and pulled security, and on the rooftop is where one of those soldiers took a picture of me with the children's blood all over the front. When the video went public, McCord decided to do the same. He has since left the Army and is happy to tell his story to anyone who'll listen. Why should soldiers be the only ones who have to see this? They should see babies split open. Fair is fair. Maybe if people started seeing this stuff and stopped living this fake, you know, reality, uh, they wouldn't be so quick to support a war. The damning Apache footage was released on April 5th, 2010. Pretty much every news organization carried the story. Not good for the U.S. military. Clear. However, that same month, the volcano in Iceland with the unpronounceable name erupts, causing major disruption to air travel. Then BP's oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico explodes, and that's the way the media works. New headlines push out old stories, and the world moves on. A footnote to Ethan McCord's story, both of the children he rescued from that van survived. 2008. The United States is on the brink of a massive economic meltdown. The Iraq war is dragging on, and Americans aren't feeling too positive about the future. They're desperate for change. And they get it. New President Barack Obama, with his yes we can mantra, makes it seem like anything is possible. The Obama effect is quite interesting. Here we have this new president, a black man with Muslim roots, who introduces a new word into the lexicon, global engagement. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means uh, a more tolerant, a less confrontational approach, and the possibility of peace in the Middle East. I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning. That one of our Obama's popularity in the Arab world is rising, and he wants to exploit the propaganda value of the warm and fuzzy feeling while it lasts. There must be a sustained effort to listen to each other, to learn from each other, to respect one another, and to seek common ground. As the Holy Quran tells us, be conscious of God and speak always the truth. Obama is a game changer. He promised to pull the troops out of Iraq, and he sets about doing just that, action that'll certainly win him points back home. However, the real unfinished business is in Afghanistan. And in May 2011, Barack Obama scores the knockout punch. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. The U.S. military releases footage of a pathetic old man looking at videos from his glory years. It's a huge coup for Obama and the United States government. It was important for the American public to know that Osama bin Laden was dead and maybe to feel a bit of a vengeance. From the Muslim perspective, uh, dumping the body in the sea was viewed as a humiliation, a desecration of a dead body. Osama bin Laden is dead. George Bush is long gone, and Barack Obama doesn't even mention the war on terror. But is that it? Is the war on terror over? And if so, who won? Well, I mean, we're never going to win a war on terror. It's like you can't win a war on murder. Uh, it, it's, it's always going to exist. I've always thought that the war on terror was a ridiculous name for a war, that, that you can't fight terrorism, can't fight an, an idea, a method. Um, so. So do I think what Bush had envisioned as the war on terror? I think that was over when Obama came in and stopped calling it that. The death of bin Laden brings the war on terror uh, to an end, certainly from the American perspective. However, from the jihadist Muslim perspective, 
This is seen as an ongoing crusade against American presence in the Middle East. And until that American presence is removed, then this war will continue. Where there are wars, there will always be propaganda, ways to influence and persuade the way we think. It's not unlike advertising. Sometimes the propaganda message is factually accurate. Sometimes it's inspired by true events. And often, it's simply made up, a total fabrication. The key is figuring out where the truth lies. What we've experienced in the past hundred years is unquestionably the age of propaganda. With the proliferation of the means of communications, information superhighways have developed. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing because propaganda is an ethically neutral term. It can be good or it can be bad. But what is important is that we retain a critical perspective and remain vigilant, that we question the messages in order to remain one step ahead of the propagandist. It's also a timely reminder that in the constant battle for hearts and minds, it's also about pictures and words and not just about bombs and missiles.